Welcome to this episode of Robots in Depth. Today I'm honored to have Achim Lilienthal here from Örebro University. And we're going to talk about everything in robotics, but it's also going to be some emergency robotics, I understand. And that's a field I really like. Because when you have trouble, you need help. And a robot that can help you when people can't is a great thing, right? But first, how did you get started in robotics? How did you end up in this field? So um, I got actually uh, started by um, finding out that uh, my previous um, my previous education which is in physics could be useful for robotics as well when I saw that uh, the group where I started my PhD was working on uh, gas sensing with robots hmm. so that I found really interesting and I found that um, there my field of study hmm. could actually be useful and so I changed well I had to convince my supervisor of course but I changed my uh, study subject, and then I started with um, with gas sensing robots, basically smelling robots. That was that was the idea, and um, afterwards I learned that uh, several researchers had tried this, and it is quite difficult um, because of the difficult properties that gases show uh, when they disperse in the environment. Mm, but I was lucky uh, due to uh, number of uh, let's say good choices in the experimental design mm -hmm. one could also say luck mm -hmm. uh, the, <laughs> the first experiments after uh, some failures uh, went well and mm -hmm. then I got into this and I got more into this and uh, then I realized that it actually relates to um, an experience that I had as a child mm -hmm. where uh, a I don't know, a second great cousin or so, hmm? of uh, mine died in, a, in an accident. Oh, tragic. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, have a, I should say I have a really, really big family. Mm. So you, you can find everything there. Mm -hmm. um, but he was working in a, in a slaughterhouse. Oh, okay. And uh, the slaughterhouse was built um, on ground that was uh, not strong enough to hold the slaughterhouse. Uh -huh. So there was an ill construction. And then it sank down and below it was a, an overland pipeline. Ah. And so it cracked the pipeline open over the weekend. The gas actually ah. escaped into the uh, into the slaughterhouse, and he he actually was the first one to arrive on mm. Monday morning. Switched on the light, mm. and the whole thing exploded. Yeah. And there was, uh, the, the, so the, I, I searched for the original newspaper articles, mm. and there was actually a train that was lifted fully off the track mm. uh, that was just passing by. And the mm. thing that that caught my attention, so I was three mm. years old at the mm. time, and when my uh, aunts and so when they told me the story they always said there was nothing that you could have done mm. to prevent this accident mm. because nobody could smell the gas mm. now mm. later on I found out uh, when I studied uh, the newspaper mm. articles that this wasn't exactly true mm. so they did smell something but they couldn't find out where the gas came from mm. or exactly what it was they smelled something funny but this e being a slaughterhouse I'm presuming e that the wasn't the, the exactly. only thing that smelled <laughs> funny yeah? exactly so in the end, they always said there was nothing you could do because mm. they didn't think of this. They didn't know of this this pipeline. Mm. Um, and um, then when I s when I wrote down my PhD thesis, I thought about this, mm. and uh, my answer to it nowadays is uh, this was an area where you would never think of putting gas sensors. Mm. But if you have gas sensors as a part of robots mm. that are there anyway, mm. then you could even prevent such accidents mm -hmm. and, and 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 gases are reasonably uh, common so I mean this is a big problem right yeah. so y did you design the gas sensor or did you integrate it in a robot or how, what did you work on so now now we're actually uh, driving into the direction of this project that we want mm -hmm. to talk about mm -hmm. because um, when I started this as a PhD student mm -hmm. uh, we used sensors that are that you can actually buy mm -hmm. Uh, so commercial sensors and they are designed for laboratory situations mm. so you take them mm. and you um, you actually expose them to gas in a very controlled way mm. so the gas has to be kept at very stable uh, temperature you have to make sure that the uh, humidity doesn't change a lot mm. and you should actually also make sure that uh, the flow of the gas past mm. the sensor is roughly constant mm. And now you take those sensors out of those situations and mm. try them on a robot, which mm. obviously has to introduce a number of uh, additional difficulties that you have to overcome. Mm. And one of the key dif difficulties is that the sensors react very slowly. Mm. So you expose them to gas, 
And then it's not that they immediately show this concentration, mm -hmm. but rather they uh, th it needs some time to, to reach a steady state. Mm, to ramp up, so to To speak. ramp up, exactly. Mm. This is bad, but much worse is that it takes very long to, uh, ah. to basically recover. Yeah, they're going to tell you it's gas there when, when there hasn't been gas there for uh, quite... Uh, are we talking seconds or minutes? Or we are talking minutes. Or yeah. So we are talking uh, seconds, tens of seconds in the re uh, response, mm. and then tens of seconds to hundreds of seconds mm. in recovery. So what it means is that they always tell you something also about the history of gas you have been exposed to. Mm. And since then it was always um, in my mind that we have those sensors with, with some limitations for robots, mm. uh, for robotics. Mm. And um, therefore I wanted to also uh, continue to work or improve the sensors. Now mm. we are not working, uh, we are not a group that works on the hardware, mm. but Smokebot was the first program, uh, was the first project, sorry, in which there was a partner. Mm. Um, in this case, it was the University of Warwick, Julian Gardner, mm. and they were working on the gas sensors for the first time to make gas sensors for robots. Mm, mm, very interesting. Yeah. Again, that's uh, a, a very different thing as compared to gas sensors for the lab. Huh? Exactly. They have to be. Uh, they have to be much more robust. They can't be as finicky when it comes to constant flow. Uh, is it also so that the gases are mixed? The uh, gases are also mixed with, with first and foremost the atmosphere and then wherever. So there, there are two aspects in this. One of the key improvements there was that um, our partner tried to improve the response time, mm. basically the speed with which the robot responds mm. and recovers. Mm. Um, and the second thing is, uh, which, which also describes the general setting of this, this project, is that we had new hardware av available, mm. but we also worked on the software mm. to deal with those new sensors and also deal with uh, the existing sensors in a way um, that we, for example, address these mixed gas situations. Mm. Uh, so we developed, uh, especially in Erdogan, we developed an approach mm. with which you can sense gases that you haven't been trained to before. Ah. One of the key limitations that we have is uh, that when we want to design a robot mm. uh, for, let's say, a gas task, mm. we should know which gas, of course, the mm. robot should, send, mm. uh, should, should sense. Mm. But we should also know which other gases are present mm. so that it doesn't get um, disturbed by the presence of those gases. Mm. Now this is, this is a very tough assumption mm. because in which area do you know about all the possible gases that no. you could come by? Mm. And therefore we developed a, uh, this is all machine learning basically, mm. and therefore we developed a machine learning approach that can deal with unknown gases mm. and then that finds out, okay, well this smells like something I have smelled before without knowing what it is mm -hmm. and without knowing the exact number of gases. Yeah, there. it just finds gas one, two and three and three it recognizes as, uh, as, uh, as, ga uh, as a petrol gas. Exactly. And, and how does it handle vapors and stuff? Is that also, I mean, gasoline, for instance, gives off flammable vapors. Yeah. Those are not gases, I understand, right? Yeah, uh, we also had, um, we, we also sometimes saw reactions to the, f to the smoke that we yeah, created. Yeah, and well, that was my next question. Yeah. Because uh, smoke is, it, it, it's not a vapor, it's not really a gas, right? It's suspended particles, right? Yeah, well, th this is a tricky question because there are many different ways in which yes. you can detect gases. Some of them will respond, some of them will not. One of the sensor that is used most often, one of the class of sensors mm. that is used most, most often in robotics, um, shows something or carries out something like an oxidation reaction. So it's, it's basically burning on the surface. Mm. And depending on what gas is around, this works better or worse. Mm. That actually then is translated into a change of resistance. Mm. And then you have different such sensors and the fingerprint of the reaction mm. tells you then something about um, the identity of the gas mm. and how much of it you have there. Mm. Um, and with this signal you have to work. Mm. And, now we, and then in addition you have this issue with the uh, response time and uh, um, recovery time, mm. plus you have the issue of the difficult way gases spread out. Mm. 
Mm. And if you take all that into account, what we can do at the moment is so we can send the robot into a room mm. and in this room it w could, for example, report you. I have seen three gases which I believe are the same and they are distributed in the room in this way. Mm. So it Kind of a heat map of where there is how much and where and, and what gas. So. Exactly. So, and then you could send in, uh, you know, like a, a more expensive sensor mm. um, that could also then identify the type of gas um, with a higher certainty mm. and could also tell you the name of the gas, which mm. is, of course, important. Mm. But you could already guide such a maybe second robot mm. or a person by saying, well, here is seems the concentration is really high mm. or here we have a high probability that you can actually measure the gas. Mm. Ah, okay, very interesting. Very interesting. Mm. So you, you, you put this sensor on a robot and send it into a potentially dangerous area, a fire, an emergency of exactly. some kind. Can you talk a little bit about the robot hardware just so that yeah. that's not your project, right? Your, your work is the sensor, or? Yes, in this, so in the, the uh, Smokebot project, we mm. brought together six partners. Mm. Uh, they, those were all partners of the project and some of them worked on sensors mm. and some of them worked on the approaches to deal with those sensors. Mm. Now, I think the, the key sensors that are different from other robotics projects mm. that we had were, was this uh, new uh, electronic nose, it's called, so mm. new gas sensors. Um, but very importantly, because we send the robot into an environment where there's smoke, and that's usually the end of using a robot, <laughs> because what sensor can mm. you use there? Mm. You can't use a camera, mm. this just shows mm. smoke. Yeah. <laughs> and you also can't use uh, a laser scanner, mm. uh, because laser is also absorbed. Reflected by the smoke. Yeah. Exactly, so what you see is actually a small circle around uh, the robot, mm. which is, depending on the thickness of the smoke, is maybe a bit wider if it's, if it's not as mm. thick and maybe a bit closer if, if it's thicker, but that doesn't tell you anything. Mm. So we needed a sensor that can actually work also when there is very low li uh, visibility. Mm. And uh, for that we teamed up with a partner in uh, Germany, mm. which is the Fraunhofer Institute in Wachberg, mm. mm. and they have uh, I don't know, actually, I hope I don't say anything wrong, but at least 50 years of experience with radar. Yeah. And yeah. so what we had on top of the robot is the first step in a development that we did there, which is a, is a, is a radar that actually moves like this mm -hmm. and gives uh, 2D um, information. Because it can go through the, the smoke and, 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 and the, the situation, it can work in the situation of a fire. Exactly. So mm. with all the smoke we have tested so far, mm. it was more or less not affected by it, mm. Mm. which was, of course, very nice for the, for the firemen to mm. see that. Mm. So we send in the robot and these are situations where firemen also with a lot of experiment experience sometimes mm. get lost. Mm. And then you can still see the walls and the robot builds a map of the environment mm. where nothing else will work. And this is something that, that, that we talk about in robotics now and then is that some people feel that robots are going to come and take their jobs. Exactly. And, and although that's not in any way near true, it's also so that there are many jobs that everyone prefer that a robot do. Because exactly. going into these very dangerous situations, we have two problems. We have to save people in there but we can't send in more people to do it because the likeliness that they all die, right? Yes. And it's all, it comes to a point where it's simply not possible for a human to go in, but we still have the, imp the, 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 the duty to, to help the people that needs assistance. Yeah. And of course, the only answer to that question is, is, is a robot that is disposable, right? Yeah, that's exactly true. Mm -hmm. And I have to say one thing that I learned in this project is that I have even more respect for firemen. Yes, they Be do a dangerous job. They do a dangerous job and, and uh, we discussed about different situations and at the moment we have a robot mm. that is on tracks mm. uh, and therefore is limited in speed. Mm. And so what we are talking about are situations mm. where there is enough time mm. and the firemen just say, you know, no matter how dangerous it is, mm. well, of course, mm. if, it, if it's clear that the building will collapse, then mm. that's maybe an exceptional situation. Mm. But we go in. If mm. there's not enough time, then we go in. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. well, that's very impressive. I've, I've heard that also from other rescue robotic work, the, the people that work with rescue robotics, is that we can't accommodate the robot in this process. 
we need to save these people. Yeah. And as long as the risk is anywhere near acceptable, we have to do that quickly. And I think th I understood that that leads to a testing problem because, for instance, <laughs> in, in earthquake situations, we want to test our robots. Mm. But we can't do that if we are in the way of, of course potentially can. more pr better performing humans. But we also have to test to develop yes. our robots, right? So, so that was also something interesting in this project because we had one partner, the fire brigades in Dortmund, mm. they actually have a test house. Mm. They can mm. set this house on fire yeah, yeah. Every whenever day, they ten want. Ten times a day. Yes. Right? And uh, it's, very, it's very interesting. So there's inside, there it's hot and there are mm. flames and there's smoke everywhere. Mm. And if something goes wrong, then they have the house cold and smoke free in 50 seconds. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It was yeah. really, so really interesting. To, 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 to save any training firefighter in there yeah. from, from a problem that got out of hand. Which I, I, I presume also makes them, gives them the confidence of, of actually pushing. Absolutely. And, and testing yes. things that they think that this might not work because 50 seconds later it's yes. off, right? Yes, yes. Mm. So, so that's, uh, that's something that they use heavily for mm. testing. Mm. And that's, of course, also something that we could use for testing our robot. Mm. Mm. And um, in a sense, you know, like the, I, I'm not so worried about the speed limitation that we mm. currently have because mm. that's something really currently. Mm. We mm. developed... Um, the technology mm. so that the robot um, could actually step in for humans mm. where it's really dangerous. Mm. So, mm. you know, exactly, uh, I fully subscribe to what you said. It's not, our robot is not a job killer mm. and it's not a killer. It's, mm. it's really something where I, I think there is hardly any debate or can not be a debate about that you want robots there. Mm. You mm. really take over a task where you wouldn't want to send a human in. And the task is unavoidable. We, we, we have a, an impetus, we have to do it. Exactly. And, and, we, uh, and we can't send anybody in to do it. And, and fires are a reasonably common situation. We, I've talked rescue robotics with, with many people and, and we talk about nuclear accidents or, yep. or something like that. But those are quite rare. I mean, fires we have every day. And I also know that, for instance, firefighting today face a new challenge and that is electrical cars. They mm -hmm. burn and they generate chemicals that firefighters aren't protected against yep. with their equipment today. So, and, and cars are usually parked in garages, which yeah. is, then, then you have all the problem of, of, of entering a confined space yep. with potential smoke, with potential explosions, very toxic chemicals yep. uh, that could easily kill you. Uh, and go straight through the clothing, even the firefighters stick clothing straight through. Um, and to the extent that we want to say value is one thing, we could just let it burn and take care of it when it's done. That could lead to environmental problems, yeah. but, it, but we also have to be sure that there's no people in there, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and then of course, in this case, the only answer is, is a robot, right? Yes, I, um, of course I would say so. <laughs> and but I, yeah, I, I think that would also be a common answer to mm, it, you know? Yeah. I, no sane person would come to the conclusion, let's send, the, send in a person, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter if they you, die tomorrow. Yeah, right? yeah, you wouldn't want that. Yeah. No, <laughs> absolutely not. No. And I see it like that, that the technology that we develop, mm. we have developed on uh, this robot with tracks that mm. is basically moving on the ground. Mm. But of course, there is, um, of course, there are some practical issues with the uh, hardware that we have at the moment, which mm. might be too big, mm. uh, but they can be resolved and then you could have the system on a drone. Mm. And then you are much faster. Mm. Um, mm. And especially for people detection, mm. which is something that we didn't cover so far, mm. uh, but where we uh, could see that is actually, um, especially people detection. People detection is critical, I would exactly. I, Finding out if there are people there and where are they, uh, and guiding them, the firefighter, the safest, either the robot or a firefighter, the safest route s and to, to get them out. Uh, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I guess the speed is more or less the current hardware platform. I mean, even a tracked vehicle could easily go 50, 60 miles an hour. Of course. Of, but you have to design it differently. Uh, one thing I talked about here is that you probably don't need to deploy this robot for a very long time. A regular house fire is probably over in half an hour f f from the time that the firefighters arrive at the scene. So even though it's run on a battery, 
it actually isn't a huge issue, right? It shouldn't be. We had actually as requirement that it should have one hour of battery time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and within this time, it should return safely. Mm. Um, and if not, uh, just a bigger robot could have a bigger battery. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's, that's not. Mm. I mean, it was also a requirement that uh, I think two men can actually easily lift it. Yeah, yeah, to so get over obstacles. and Because yeah. this is what we call a deconstructed environment. Yeah. I mean, you, we live our lives in a constructed environment. Yeah. Staircases go up and down and floors are horizontal. Uh, if we're talking about nuclear accidents or sh accidents on ships, yeah. Suddenly you got the stairs on the walls, on the walls are stairs, and, and, and everything becomes a very strange place. Yeah. And a fire I is also a deconstructed environment. Yeah. So, so you have to be very adaptable. Huh? Yes, you, you would uh, for sure expect that not everything is as, as it otherwise looks like. Mm. Um, still, sometimes it could be that you see some basic structures yeah, of, of the environment. Mm. And uh, we, for example, in this project also worked on an approach where uh, a fireman mm. could uh, either just draw a sketch of the environment mm. or take an emergency map mm. and then point the robot to ah, a place where it should get go there. there. And then the robot, mm. uh, when it is in sight, with uh, the measurements, for example, from the, from the radar, mm. uh, builds its own map and tries to find out what the operator meant. Mm. And that's not so simple as it sounds because, mm. first of all, even the emergency maps are often wrong in scale mm. and, and wrong in you know, like the, the details. Mm. And then, of course, you have this situation where what you call deconstructed, you know, mm. where there is a lot of irregularities mm. or differences. And then you have all the uh, furniture, for example, mm. which is not in the, no. in the map. Mm. And therefore, that's, that's pretty, pretty difficult. But on the other hand, it helps in two things. It helps in the communication, mm. where the operator tells the robot, go to this place. Mm, mm. And it also helps when the robot loses connection mm. and then plans a path back and maybe mm. a door closed. Mm. And then it knows, it could know from this map mm. where there is maybe an alternative path. So, so we're now looking at this prototype. We are learning how to navigate in smoke. We're learning how to detect what kind of gases are here. Is this building going to say kaboom? Uh, and I've heard about other uh, gas explosion, uh, and they were building um, uh, a, fo uh, a bomb shelter. As it was supposed to be the foundation of a multi-story building, and they put on heaters for the concrete over the winter. Okay. But the flame went out, but the gas was on. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> this was a finished concrete, like meter-thick concrete f bomb shelter. Yeah. But when they came in, they turned on the electricity uh, where they were, had their clothing yeah. and other things like that. But it also turned in on the, the electricity on the building side, so everything went up, but there were no people in there. Okay, oh, good luck. But they didn't find a single piece of concrete. So, I mean, meter thick concrete was just blown off. away. Oh. So, I mean, the forces <laughs> there are unbelievable. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and, and to get in there and to do this work is, is, is just mind-boggling. Yeah. Um, we then, we have the sensor, we can yeah. navigate. Can we also address the problem? Can we pick up people? Can we, uh, can we determine if a person is alive or dead? Yeah. Can we maybe try to suppress the fire? Okay, M many questions. <laughs> um, so. And, and even one before, mm. which was detecting gases mm. and detecting risks of explosions. That's yeah. not exactly the same. No, no. So we have, in this project, we have looked at um, a data structure that collects all the information mm. and then tries to infer from all the information whether there is a, a risk of explosion. Mm. So, for example, where there is a lot of gas mm. of a certain type and high temperatures. Mm. So mm. that is something that we addressed. Mm. Then detecting uh, people and discovering whether mm. they are alive. Mm. This is something that we want to do in future projects. Mm. This is um, very important, uh, something that we discussed a lot during the project, mm. but the money was not for that. But you think that that would be a tractable problem? You think that given enough resources, we could, even in this very dangerous, uh, very difficult environment, Absolutely. detect that a person is dead or alive? Because, of course, we want to focus our efforts, uh, our uh, rescue efforts 
on the people with the best prognosis. Otherwise, yeah. we, uh, we might not save anybody, right? No, exactly. This is something we must do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, a uh, very strong, very strong argument for doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah saving life is probably the, the most significant thing we can do, right? Absolutely. Um, then there was the question of manipulation. Yes. Can we do something? Can yeah. we help the people? Mm. And that's harder. Mm. So um, robots that uh, manipulate, um, you know, like, um, or how do you say that? Deformable object. Mm -hmm. This is not uh, politically correct mm -hmm. to call a human a deformable this object. It's a soft object. Soft yeah. object, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. I know that that's a very challenging problem. In this is a very challenging mm -hmm. problem. Uh, you would have to have probably a bigger robot mm -hmm. for that. Um, and simply, you would need at mm -hmm. least two such projects. Mm -hmm. So in this project, we only looked at the robot as an explorer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have, for example, uh, an ongoing uh, European Union project which looks at robots that unload goods from shelves with mm -hmm. two arms. Mm -hmm. um, and there we study the manipulation mm. um, problem more. Mm. Um, until it really reaches um, a robot, I think, f a robot in, in such disaster scenarios, mm -hmm. I wouldn't predict this for the next five years. Uh, this is going to sound macabre, but we might also be trying to pick up a deconstructed human. Yeah. They might be hurt. Yeah. I mean, I if we know that you're perfectly like you are, we could just grab you by the foot or the arm yeah, yeah, and just... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's better to try to pull you out than to Absol just leave you there, right? Yeah, yeah. If the robot grabs your arm and pulls yeah. you out, we, we'll deal with the scratches later. Yeah. But if your arm or if you're seriously hurt, we might do further damage. Yes. And we, we then have to evaluate your... How are you hurt? And how can we help you while still minimizing the risk of harming you further, right? Yeah. We well, might be forced to harm you further because yeah. it's better to harm you and get you out than yeah. not harm you. Yeah, yeah. Very hard questions. You have to make these decisions every day, right? In yeah. many accidents yeah. is uh, how you actually uh, arrange the transport of mm -hmm. a person. Mm -hmm. And um, that very much, as far as I know, um, is uh, relies on the experience of doctors and, mm. and of uh, paramedics mm, mm. Um, and I don't but see we can't put those in that situation exactly mm. exactly mm, that, that I don't see um, to be achieved in the near future mm. and um, that's also not something that would directly lend itself to uh, AI as we call machine mm. learning these days mm. um, so that is not something that will happen soon. We will have to deal with other problems first. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if we can already uh, help human mm. uh, rescue mm. uh, staff mm. by pointing out here is where you should go, mm. um, by also helping... And this is the route you should go. This is the route you should take. Here mm. is not dangerous. Mm. Here is a person and here you should really mm. uh, speed up. Mm. This person is unfortunately um, already dead, so mm. we, we cannot help there. That's that's actually where a robot can be useful. Yeah, very very nice. Uh, and I, I, what, I mean, you've been working on one robot here, but yeah. what we could potentially do, of course, is to have quite a number of these robots. And when the firefighters arrive, they just let them loose. Yeah. And robot te the robots uh, pack basically yeah. works together with the firefighters of uh, going maybe ahead of them and saying this is too dangerous for you I'll do it yeah. but that also frees up the firefighter to do to work in other areas yes. w where it's safe-ish and, 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 and they could explore that area and be more directly relating to any people they can find there. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah absolutely the goal will always be uh, to um, ensure safety of the humans, mm. um, but also to uh, reduce their cognitive load. Mm. So mm. at the mm. moment, we are always thinking about those robots as remote controlled first, mm. because in this way, the human can still take the decision. Mm. We, we also have anticipated the situation that uh, suddenly Wi-Fi connection is lost, mm. and then the robot goes back to a point where it no knows I had a good connection, mm, mm. but otherwise there's always a human. Mm. And then it's an important question to send to the human mm. only information that is very important, mm. but nothing in addition, mm, because mm. otherwise... Overload will then yeah. make you less efficient, right? Exactly. If you're in the way of 
uh, if you're in the way of them, these people doing their job, you can basically kill people. And that's exactly. kind of frowned upon yeah, in, yeah. in most societies. Yes. Uh, yeah. So this is, it's a very, very interesting area. It's a very, it's an interesting, it, it's an area that has a huge uh, reason for being. Um, but it also has a number of technical challenges, but also a number of moral challenges. How do we test them in a real life scenario when mm -hmm. they might be inferior to another one? Uh, and, and, and yeah, so this is a fascinating area. Um, so the project is, the first project is now done and you've shown the results. Uh, have you, you worked with the firefighters in Dortmund? Yes. Uh, have you also been to any proper house fires and, and actually uh, used <laughs> it, so to say, in, in anger or in this case in, 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 in the rescue scenario? Actually, um, one particular uh, scenario that we discussed and that we also try to detect with a robot mm. that there is danger of is a so-called rollover mm. and that's um, when uh, the fire is heating up uh, the the air and the mm. smoke mm. and then suddenly the smoke is uh, so hot mm. that it also starts to burn mm. Mm. and that's actually a moment in which suddenly everything around you mm. is burning mm. Mm. and the fire brigade showed me that while i was in the room mm. Mm. and they didn't tell me much they just said um, I think this this was kind of a, a ritual. Mm. Uh, they told me now it's you know you should uh, go down, mm. Mr. Lilienthal, mm. on mm. the knees, mm. and if it gets really hot on mm. your head, mm. just one advice: don't stand up. <laughs> 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 and then they counted Whoosh. five. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and that that I think they uh, they also did in order to show what's the the work of those mm. uh, firemen this and the, the, the environment and the the challenges they face yeah. uh, yes. uh, yeah. kind of brings it home in a very, <laughs> very, very, very concrete way, right? Absolutely. I was impressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So where do you see, the, I mean, I hope, we, we certainly hope that you can continue this project and develop it. Where do you see you taking this from now on, right? So they are, uh, from the technology that, that we developed, there are lots of, of small strings that we will uh, continue. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to the system as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, I think the most important further developments would be first uh, with respect to the actual application. So mm -hmm. robots that have fire brigades mm -hmm. would be what we already discussed, mm -hmm. detection of people mm -hmm. and bringing it on uh, something that moves fast, like mm -hmm. a drone. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. this is from the perspective of uh, the application. Mm -hmm. These are two very natural new steps. Mm -hmm. um, then um, we also saw this project as a milestone mm -hmm. because it enables now robots to act in low visibility scenarios. Mm -hmm. And those low mm -hmm. visibility scenarios can also be in, in other situations, not just in fires. Mm -hmm. There can also be so m much dust mm -hmm. that you can't regularly use a robot. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we can do now as well. Mm -hmm. And the key sensor there is the radar sensor. Mm -hmm. now, what I mentioned before is that we have this radar that mm. um, is spinning mm. and that works very similar to a, um, a laser scanner. Mm. So we can almost exchange them. Mm. Um, but it's only 2D. Mm. And during the project, we developed something uh, that we called a radar camera. Mm. So that's, um, it actually looks like a half circle mm. and it has 24 emitters and 24 mm. receivers. Mm. Um, and with this, you can actually get 3D uh, information mm. in a single shot. Mm. Uh, so it's in this way, it's more like a camera. Mm -hmm. But the resolution then is, is lower, right? The resolution is lower and it's actually not so easy to talk about resolution or frames at all. Mm. So the principles are different. Mm. And uh, so it's also what you see. So for example, a wall, mm which is simple. Mm. It's really simple for uh, when you use a laser scanner, mm. but the wall can be very difficult for the radar mm. because if it's not rough enough, you don't see it. Ah, yes, if it's very, if it's very smooth, yes. like glass or... Exactly, then it's like, you know, it's being reflected and then you don't see it. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and there are other um, special features of mm. this sensor. Mm. And at the same time, it has a huge potential for robots. Mm. Mm. So one thing that we want to do also is to 
um, to work towards bringing radar as a standard sensor to robots. Ah, yeah, that would be cool. And this is not just introducing the, the mm. sensor, but we actually, in this, in this period of the three and a half years in this project, mm. we had a wonderful multi-dimensional um, um, multi, um, experience mm. with people working you know, in physics, in chemistry, and so on. Mm. And this um, communication between us from robotics and uh, people from uh, physics, mm. basically dealing with radar, mm. has led us to a, a number of questions where we know we have to address them mm. in order to bring the sensor as a standard sensor that you m use more or less out of the package mm. in the robotics community. And that's also something that we want to do in the future. Yeah, and that would of course be a spin-off from the from the smoke pot. It just something you needed, you developed it, and of course it has a huge application everywhere. Exactly. Uh, any new sensor we get just gives us so much more capabilities, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm. But but there is actually that the sensor gives you a lot of capabilities, but it also requires something from mm. you. So you need more understanding of this sensor than mm. you need of a camera. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and it's actually the same with the gas sensors. Mm. And mm. we've been working on the camera for a very long time, and you yeah. still have a lot left, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And here comes a totally new sensor, right? Exactly, mm. exactly. I found, that I've understood that though, that switching from one sensor to another, what is difficult with one sensor is easy with another and vice versa. So for instance, ultrasonic sensors are good at glass and transparent yeah. reflective materials. Radar is good when there's kind of maybe snow in the air or fog or, or particulate matter in the yeah. air. Uh, l LIDARs are good in some situations and, and cameras are good in others. So yeah. if, we ha if we add an additional sensor, we might, instead of trying to solve it with a, in suit, uh, non, a, suit uh, a sensor that isn't suitable, we yeah. can just switch to the suitable sensor and then, then it, the problem becomes much more tractable. Yes. That's actually also something that uh, we would want to do in the future. It's something mm. that we already thought about in the project, mm. is that you actually use a laser scanner and the uh, radar mm. at the same time. Mm. And uh, when there's lots of smoke, you can't use the lighter, mm. uh, the, the laser scanner. Mm. Um, but when there is no smoke at all, then mm. it's, it's usually the more uh, accurate sensor. Mm -hmm. So you would actually have a way to discover whether the, an individual measurement can be used or not of the laser scanner mm -hmm. and in this way combine the two. That's also something that you, you could think of, uh, of seeing the two sensors as, as one, like mm -hmm. combining them. Mm. Fusing the data from uh, from both of them and yeah. and, and and using their both the, the relative strengths, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. So this has been a fascinating story. And maybe you have some video of the robot that I can cut in here towards the end, so that people can see what we've been talking about. Absolutely, I can show you the video. Yeah. In a second. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much for taking the time to do an interview, and I'm sure we're going to follow your work as it goes along. And it it it's just amazing. If we, what we can already do is amazing and, and, and solving these many tricky problems is going to be interesting research and I'm sure society's need for these are, are huge. Eh? Thank you very much, Pierre. Thank you. <laughs>